So where are we at on the biblical time clock? We have to look at Daniel 11. Daniel 11 starts off talking about a mighty Greek king that will be scattered to the four winds. That was Alexander the Great. He died in 323 BC. During the prime of his life, and his empire was divided among his generals. Ptolemy took control of the area north of Israel that included Egypt. Seleucus took control of the area that was south of Israel that included Syria. Daniel 11 covers hundreds of years. So the kings of the north and kings of the south aren't individuals, but are actually rulers of the Ptolemaic dynasty, which was headquartered in Egypt, and the Seleucid dynasty that was headquartered in Syria. Both of these dynasties were hostile toward each other, and Israel was always caught in the middle. The king of the south is the Greek king of Egypt, of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Let's look at verses 5 and 6 first. The Seleucid king of Syria was a subject to Ptolemy, but in that time he became more powerful. The king of the south, Ptolemy, proposed a marriage alliance to unite both kingdoms. Princess Berenice from the south married the Seleucid king, and a child was born. But suddenly the king died, and the child and the wife was murdered in 246 BC. Instead of sealing an alliance, this started a war. So now we're at verse 7 through 10. This was fulfilled when Princess Berenice's brother, who was king of Egypt, carried out a successful campaign against the north in 245 to 241 BC. Later, the Syrian kingdom tried to retaliate and even attempted to invade Egypt. In verses 11 through 13, this was fulfilled when Syria defeated Egypt in 217 BC. The king of the south slaughtered 20% of the Syrian army, but the victory was short-lived. Syria invaded again with a bigger army and was successful. In verses 14 through 16, this was fulfilled when Israel was initially under the control of the Ptolemaic kingdom of the south. But with the Syrian victory, Israel was then passed under the control of the Seleucid king of the north, and that was in 200 BC. Verses 17 through 29, talks about another marriage alliance in 193 BC. The daughter of the king of the north sided with her husband from the south. So then the Seleucid king of the north attacked a bunch of Greek islands and part of Asia Minor. Verse 20 was fulfilled when the Seleucid successor was preoccupied with getting money to keep Rome at bay. He was unsuccessful in trying to attempt to loot the temple in Jerusalem and his kingship was cut short. And now this brings us to Antiochus, one of the most notorious and brutal kings of the north. Verses 21 through 45 is all about his reign. He was not a legitimate heir to the throne and took the throne at 187 BC by force. Antiochus took the name Epiphanes, which means God manifests. Antiochus invaded Egypt in 169 BC. The king of Egypt was young and inexperienced, so he was defeated. On his way home, Antiochus looted the temple in Jerusalem. He also stationed a garrison there and defiled the temple by sacrificing unclean animals there. After returning home, Antiochus decided to invade the south again. He was met by the Romans who told him to cease and desist. He had no choice but to comply, and he was left completely humiliated. In his second attempt to loot the temple, Antiochus tried to buy off Jewish officials, and he stopped the daily sacrifices. But this time he was met with Jewish resistance, which was the Maccabean Revolt in 167 BC. The revolt was met with mixed support and mixed success with the Jewish populace with some help with Rome, which later became the occupying power. Antiochus did whatever he wanted to. He even proclaimed himself to be God by taking the title Epiphanes, which means God manifest. He chose the Sabbath day as a day of worship to him, and he did not rely on any pagan gods, but on his own financial and military might. In verses 40 through 45, it's talking about the end of time, and it's pretty amazing. There's no doubt that the focus of chapter 11 was about Antiochus, but he's only one of the many kings of the north. Verse 40 through 45 is talking about a final king of the north that will outdo Antiochus with his pride and blasphemy. He will be the final Antichrist at the end of history. We don't know who that is, but we can see what area this king is going to be from. It's the king of the north. So where is the king of the north? This area right here is the Seleucid Empire. So the king of the north comes from here, this area, and this is the king of the south, the Ptolemaic Empire. I want to bring your attention to the Collective Security Treaty Organization. It's an intergovernmental military alliance in Eurasia consisting of six post-Soviet states. This consists of Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, and Tajikistan. This is modern day who makes up the king of the north. Now with that in mind, let's read verse 40 through 45. 
At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage the king of the north in battle, and the king of the north will storm out against him with the chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Talking about Israel. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of the Ammon will be delivered from his hand. So who are these? Those are from the area of Jordan, the Palestinians, which we know want to take over Israel. In 2015, Putin began to take the Seleucid Empire. Reports confirm that he had operational boots on the ground in Syria, which is a big deal. The little horns of Daniel 7 and 8 illustrate younger and stronger nations of two opposing forces in the last days. These two little horns are symbolic of the Roman and Grecian empires. Western Europe and America today represent the Roman Empire and its little horn. And we know who the Grecian Empire is with Russia as its little horn. Now, if we look at the Roman Empire, it's not a coincidence that it was divided into the Western and Eastern in the 5th century. Its geological makeup resembled that of the Roman and the divided Grecian Empire before it was gobbled up by Rome. The Eastern Roman Empire resembled that of the Seleucid Empire and the Western as the Ptolemaic. History proves that the culture in the Orthodox religion of Eastern Rome moved northward into Russia, thereby fulfilling prophecy of the little horn in Daniel 8. In the same manner, America is where the culture and religion of Western Rome moved to. The spreading of Eastern Rome into Russia and the Russia-Syrian alliance of today explains the little horn in Daniel 8 and is referring to both Russia and Syria. Daniel 7, 8, and 11 reveals what we are seeing today with the east-west conflict. Now let's read the last chapter of Daniel, chapter 12. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Philippians chapter 2 verse 15 says, So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Verse 2 also coincides with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 to 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Matthew chapter 24 verse 29. In Matthew chapter 24 it says, Immediately after the tribulation, when the Son of Man appears, he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Because we will be delivered from tribulation. We are almost there.